Welcome to another episode of Eric Wait Whiskey Studies Live. So now I got the beard back, changed the banner, put the old icon on there with the beard. Uh, so I'd bring back the intro to Eric Wait Whiskey Studies Live with the, with the beard. Um, I missed y'all last week. I was in Texas at the uh, Bastards Bowl. Bastards Bowl really is a whiskey vault event. And us other whiskey tubers are invited to sort of tag along. Um, my experience is sort of like it used to be more of a communal whiskey tuber event. And it seems we sort of been shifted into the backwoods. No complaints. No complaints. Had a great time. Great meeting up with uh, with people there. I was really, really thankful. You know, when you when you do a big event like that, there's so much going on. There's so much planning that goes into it that um, isn't seen by those who are at the event. So I know there's some logistical challenges this year. <coughs> Previous year, obviously with COVID and all that, there were challenges. Um, you know, just the faculty there uh, has been is changed new or new to things. Uh, they've lo lo lost some faculty, so I, I want to give a big thanks to everyone who was working behind the scenes to get everything uh, together to work. Of course, there are there are always there are always technological uh, challenges. They're dealing with that as well, yeah, you know, internet issues and stuff like that. And then uh, it was ninety five degrees, one hundred percent humidity. One of the other challenges they have there is. Austin is one of the is one of the fastest growing cities in the United States. A lot of Cal, I'm, I apologize to the city of Austin, but a lot of Californians are, are heading out there. It's booming and busting. Uh, real estate costs are going up, and it's a destination for events. And the result is trying to book hotels, space, stuff like that can be challenging because when the place is busy, the cost of everything just goes up, and costs are already you know, uh, up on everything. So it, it, you know, it's a big challenge to pull things off. And I want to thank everyone who was involved behind the scenes, uh, who made it happen. And I'm going to give a special thanks to Daniel Whittington, you know, Daniel and Rex, you know, they're the, the main guys there. Right. And, uh, magnificent bastards traveling from all over the United States, all over the, uh, all over the world. Um, tra travel there for this big event, and everybody wants Rex's attention, everybody wants Daniel's attention. And, and so, for Daniel to take, I don't know, 15 minutes out, whatever it was, to jump in on a live stream, I think I was the only person who went live at the, at the Bastards Ball. For Daniel to take 15 minutes out, whatever it was, to jump in with a li live stream with me, I greatly appreciate it because I know he was super busy. Also, if you didn't see the live stream, check it out live from the Bastards Ball. Uh, Daniel Whittington jumped on, and then Bill from the Whiskey Dictionary uh, jumped in. And um, you could hear in Daniel's voice, it was a little bit rough, like he's overcoming a cold or heavy allergies, whatever it was. So, you know, everything else he's dealing with, to jump in and do a live stream with me, hey, um, thank you very much, Daniel, if you're, if you're happy to ever see this. So, Taste and Sensibility, thanks for tuning in. David Belcher, Chris Yu, James Morgan, Duke McHale, uh, George or Jorg, uh, uh, depending on how you pronounce your name, or Jorge, uh, how you pronounce your name. Thanks for uh, tuning in. Let me pour myself a little bit of something. This is the Lafroig Karchis uh, Triple Wood. This is a phenomenal, phenomenal whiskey. I got to say it's probably the, this and the, and the cast strength, 10 cast strength, probably my, my favorites uh, from uh, Lafroig. I'll give you the notes on this in a minute. There we go. After we do our quiz. Lefroig has probably come up in rank for me in terms of favorite distilleries. Ardbeg is stepped down a notch due to the not, and I've already talked this about another video. Some of the nonsense that's going on with the with the these bizarre releases, the committee releases that they're, you know, the quality's not there. They're two hundred dollars plus, and it's a lot of hype from the marketing department. I've already talked about that. I'm not going to go into that, which then makes me rethink some of the other distilleries. Boonhaven, still a favorite. 
But in terms of the Cadalton distilleries, those on the southern part of I I Isla, um, Lafroig and Lagavon are there. I think Lafroig has more variances in the casts, more differentiation in the flavors from bottle to bottle or between the different bottlings than does Lagavon. Uh, I think Lagavulin is a gentler peat, much more interwoven. Lafroig, decidingly so, is a much more in your face. That's the reputation that they're going for. So if you're not familiar with Lafroig and, and the 10 year old is your first introduction, it can be a little bit overwhelming. If you happen to ever be able to get a bottle of uh, this one, I highly recommend. Now, getting in again about um, the Bastard's Ball. For the whiskey tubers, the event really is much more at the La Quinta. La Quinta is a hotel. Most people stay at the, at the La Quinta. I didn't stay at the La Quinta this year. If I'm back to, at the Bastard's Ball next year, I will be there next year. But I think the other whiskey tubers need to, and how the logistics and how you're going to pull it off, I don't know. But I would really like to see a whiskey tuber gathering event that's not focused on any one particular channel but on all of us and everybody who's there now obviously bigger channels have bigger fan bases if you want to call them that you know that that's unavoidable um, but i would really like to have a big whiskey tuber event that it is known as a whiskey tuber event and everybody who's a whiskey tuber is invited um now how you work out the logistics uh, and all that that's a whole nother thing that's a whole nother thing but I, I, would I really would like to have a whiskey tuber event that was about, particularly those, particularly those of us who's been around for a while. Uh, I've been doing this for over six years. Bill Whiskey Dictionary has been doing this for, I think, eight years. Scotch Test Dummy has been doing it for nine years. You know, of course, everybody would like to get the man, Ralphie himself, but Ralphie's much more a reserved person. So I don't know if he would come to an event like that, but who knows. Um. But I would really like to have something like that. That was much more whiskey tuber centric and not any one particular group. Uh, Dave Bocher says, uh, we all grow a handlebar mustaches like Bart. Yes. <laughs> Everybody come with their uh, beards and mustaches. Um, all righty. So by the way, speaking of which, if you haven't seen the video, Daniel jumped on. Had a, a really good time blind tasting him on one of his own, <laughs> one of his own whiskeys, uh, which I brought back a couple bottles. A bottle of Errant. I have, actually have a couple of... I picked up one last year. I had on reserve two bottles this year. Richard Amaro, thank you very much. Put a cup all aside. Uh, this is from the, from Aaron Distillery, but aged in a warehouse at the Crowded Barrel, or aged at the Crowded Barrel in Texas. So it has the climate impact of Texas, but the distillate of Aaron Distillery. Absolutely fantastic stuff. And... <laughs> a really good study on seeing the differences that climate makes uh, to a whiskey. All righty. So uh, Bill jumped on with me, and I want to share something uh, with you that Bill gave me. Um, it looks like a challenge coin from here, like a wood challenge coin, but it's a Glencairn topper. And I thought, oh, that's kind of a cool idea. It... With a regular Glen Cairn, it's got an extra little lid right here, a flexible lid right here. So on a regular Glen Cairn, it fits just like that. But on this, I have another larger Glen Cairn. It fits on that as well. So it'll fit both uh, Glen Cairns. And I think it works really, really well. Yeah, Challenge Coin, so this is a Whiskey Tribe Challenge Coin. It's got a ridge around it, and it works pretty good. The poker chips in that most channels have don't work all that great. Um, but if you have one with a ridge in it, like this one, particularly if it's metal, it works really, really well. So if you're interested in these, hawk a little wares for Bill, my brother Bill. Um, check out the Whiskey Dictionary, the Whiskey Dick, and check out his, I'm, I'm sure he's got a, a website where he sells these things. But I think it's a really, really nifty idea, real nifty idea. Uh, I had... As I was walking around the uh, Bashers Bowl, I had in my pocket my challenge coins. Um, do I have one here with me? I don't have one. Yeah, I do. No, I don't. This I do. Yeah, okay, hold on. Sorry. I had one of my own challenge coins. 
one challenge coins, and I kept these in my pocket as I walked around. I wasn't selling them, and I wasn't sitting at a table saying, hey, I got challenge coins. But if anybody walked up to me and said, oh, Eric, wait, I like your channel, I would reach in my pocket and go boom and give them one. So it was my way of recognizing or as a thank you to anybody who watches my channel and who happened to be at the at the Bastard's Ball. All right. I still I ordered originally had 300 of these. I probably got maybe 200 left or so. I'm not selling them. I'm not selling them. I haven't got the time to go to the post office. Um, that's the main issue. I haven't got time to the post office. But if I'm at an event or something like that, we have a meetup, I will have these with me. Um, so the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, uh, they have vaults uh, in the UK. But in the United States, they have sort of like a partnership uh, with various locations throughout the United States. They have one with a whiskey bar in San Francisco, and they have one in San Jose, and they have special events uh, at these at these whiskey bars, and I'm sure the whiskey bars um, keep a stock of Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. I'm gonna take a little sniff and smell. Oh man, man! One of the things about being a whiskey tuber and, and, and exploring whiskey, most people who not, not doing videos, you buy a bottle and you enjoy it. Maybe have maybe have ten bottles or whatever. Um, but you probably kill a bottle before you move on to the next one. Not all at once, obviously, over you know a couple of months, whatever, you, you know, kill a bottle. As a whiskey tuber and you're always doing the next video, once I get to about here and I do a video, this goes on the shelf and I move on and you know, I'm doing something else. So every once in a while, I might go back to another bottle to compare bottles, say first filled bourbon or sherry cask or peated cherry cask or whatever else. I'm comparing Isla peated with Highland peated, or I'm comparing, you know, Irish single malt versus a Scotch single malt, whatever, or Japanese, whatever. But doing a video like this, live stream like this, it gives me an opportunity to go back to this bottle that I really, really like, highly recommend if you can find if you can find one um, and taste it again. I'm, I'm sort of excited about the opportunity of getting back into this dram. Hmm. Well, all right. So if you want to travel, if you're in the Bay Area, you're in California, there is a Scotch Malt Whiskey Society coming up on October 2nd in San Jose. There's one in San Francisco. Uh, no, excuse me. There's an event in San Jose. This is at a place called 55 South on 55 South 1st Street in San Jose. Sunday, October 2nd, 2022. So just around the corner, a couple of weeks. It's from 5.30 to 7.30. It's $75 per member, $95 for non-members. You can get it through, I believe, Eventbrite. But if you just search for it, you can find it in order to tickets. Now, I bought my ticket probably a week ago. It could be sold out by now. I don't know. But I will be at this event. So if you are there, I will have challenge coins in my pocket. If you were there and you come up and say, hey, Eric, I like your channel, I will give you one of these coins for free. Um, so there's other events going New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, Seattle, Washington, D.C., oh, and, and San Jose. I will not be at it at the any of the other events. I will only be at this one here in San Jose. And if you're there, don't be shy. Come up to me and s introduce yourself. Please do. Um... All righty. All right, let's get into our quiz. Hope you saw my video for the uh, Scotch Malt Whiskey. That's just rolling off my tongue. Uh, Lafork, 10 year old Sherry Ocas. It's a whiskey I liked. It didn't, but wasn't as pre uh, impressive as other Oloroso peated uh, and Oloroso whiskeys. So I liked it. It seemed a little challenging. It seemed a little bit fighting with itself. It did seem to have the balance. It didn't have the transitions that I kind of like. I've already reviewed it. Check out the video. So it's a very good whiskey, very enjoyable whiskey. And there are some people who like them that dark and that rich. Uh, and, and, you know, they're peat heads if people like that. 
But for me, it didn't, it wasn't worth over 90 points. So it's not making my top 10 for the year. But this was in my top 10. I believe it was last year. Absolutely fantastic whiskey. All right, so let's get into the quiz. I believe we have nine questions, if I recall correctly. Question number one. The Frog Distillery was founded in 1779, same as Bourne Distillery. B, 1850, same as Ardbeg. C, 1817, same as Lagavulin. Or D, 1821. So in what year was La Frog Distillery founded? Belcher says B. Da -da -da -da. Doug Chris up says B. Da -da -da -da. Some people aren't guessing. Some people perhaps are watching on your phone. So you don't have the comment section going. Whatever else. All right. I don't want to linger on too long. Let's go back to answers. And the answer is B, the same as Ardbeg. Same as Ardbeg. All right, next question. Question number two. Lefroy Distillery was founded by, so who founded it? It was founded in 1815, but who founded it? A, John Johnston. B, Donald and Alex Johnston. C, James Logan Mackey. Or D, um, C, or excuse me, D, Sir Peter Mackey. So who founded Lefroy Distillery? Doug says, uh, B, Donald, and Alex Johnston. Hmm. Wow. I'm drinking this. Sorry, I'm sipping here. This is really, really nice. Da -da -da -da. So we got two Johnstons and two Mackeys. Is that a Johnston or is it a Mackey? You can go 50-50 there. And if you're going to choose between Johnstons, was it John or was it Donald and Alex? And the answer is Donald and Alex Johnston. Sorry, I don't have any prizes to give away. Uh, everybody keep your own score. This is for personal edification only. Question number three. In 1847, Donald Johnson was killed in an accident at Lafroy. So how did he die? How did Donald Johnson, the founder of distillery, die? A, by drowning in a vat of fermenting wash. B, by slipping on a wet floor. C, by an exploding still. It's a remarkable in studying the history of Scotch distilleries, how many of them have had a fire. Um, and I think I talked about this last time, that one of the reasons why a lot of distilleries are you couldn't take photographs is because they're concerned with um, igniting the alcohol in the air and starting a fire. Uh, or D, by being crushed by a falling cask. So did he drown in a fermenting vat? B, slipping on a wet floor? C, by an exploding still? Or D, by being crushed by a falling cask? Uh, McGuirat 1984 says Lefroy had at least three fires. Interesting. I think Roy uh, had this one, James Morgan says. A. And the answer is I don't know, B. By a drowning vat of fermenting wash. And it just so happens. I have a video of the event. Ah! <laughs> oops, 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 I gotta take that one off the screen. Dang it. Hold on. Give me a second here. I'm clicking buttons. There we go. By the way, for extra, for extra points, uh, can you name that scream? That scream is called the Wilhelm scream. The Wilhelm scream. It's a well-known scream. Uh, can you name a movie? Uh, I'm getting deja vu, James Morgan says. Uh, can you name a movie that used that scream? That The Wilhelm scream. Can you name one? Just put, put one in there. It's a very well-known, famous uh, 
scream and there's a particular uh director movie producer movie maker who likes to use that scream and i think just about all his films mm -mm -mm -mm. yeah see this it's got that peat smoky the Freud character base and it frames it sort of underneath and around it but in the middle is this real nice development caramel grilled stone fruits maybe some butterscotch lighter chocolate not dark chocolate but like a lighter chocolate really 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 nice yes jordan Pete, uh, J jordan raider that is correct star wars that is correct all right um next question in 1860 what distillery um merged with lafrog distillery what distillery merged with Lafroig Distillery? This, by the way, this week's quiz is a little more difficult than previous weeks. Was it Malt Mill? B, Little Mill? C, Ardnestil? I may be mispronouncing it. Or was it Canvas Distillery? What distillery merged with Lafroig Distillery? So there were, so first, two distilleries, if you saw the video. First two, first two, there are two distilleries, and they merged to form Lafroig. But then there was another distillery, neighboring distillery, that then merged with those two and became part of Lafroig Distillery. And that's where this one could be a little challenging uh, because of a number of different distilleries being associated with Lafroig. All right, and the answer is... Ardnestil, and I know you were probably thinking malt mill uh, distillery, but it was Ardnestil. Canvas wasn't even on Isla, uh, but it was uh, Ardnestil. I already pronounced that. Um, next question. In 19, excuse me, in 1877, when Dougald Johnston, who was the son of the founder, died, who assumed control of the distillery? A, nobody, the distillery temporarily closed. B, his sister Isabella and her husband, Alexander, who was also Dougald's cousin. C, the government, assumed control. Or D, ancient alien astronauts. Ancient alien astronauts. Jordan is asking, oops. Are you getting sour citrus flavor in your tasting? It almost seemed tart somehow. Like a brown sugar lemonade. I don't know if you're talking to me or if you're talking to somebody else. If you're talking to me, um, do I get? Well, there is a tartness. I could see someone saying that it's sort of a grilled lemon character on the back end, but I don't know if you're talking to me. All right. Doug says B. Mick Geer, McGeever, McGeever 1984 says B. David Butcher says B. Duke McHale says B. And the answer is his sister Isabella and her husband, who was also Dougald's cousin. So uh, basically, Dougald's sister married a cousin. Those things happen, you know. All right, next. Dougal Johnson was succeeded by Isabella and Alexander Johnston. Then it was run by Catherine and Isabella Johnston, followed by Ian Hunter. We're getting more into the history uh, and the details in this quiz than we did have in previous quizzes. When Ian Hunter died in 1954, then Ian Hunter is probably, in the history of the distillery, one of the most notable um, one of the most important figures, he's, for a whole other reason, I could do a whole video just on Ian Hunter uh, in terms of his impact on, on not just Lafroy, but uh, I, excuse me, Scottish whiskey. When Hunter died in 1954, who ran the distillery? 
A, his secretary, Elizabeth Bessie Williamson. B, his cousin, Eli Ben Williamson. A committee of five unknown people. Who ran the distillery? Was it his secretary, his cousin, or a committee of five people? Who ran the distillery? I don't have a D answer on this one just because I was running out of space when I made the slides. I just kept it the three. Who ran the distillery after Ian Hunter died? Um, James Morgan says, nice lady. He, maybe he knows the answer and he's sort of giving you all a hint. And the answer is his secretary, Elizabeth Bessie Williamson. Now, I would like to know more information about her. And there are some photos of her available online. It's just on the video. My guess is, this is just a guess. Uh, if you've ever had an administrative assistant in, in work or a secretary, whatever term you want to use, oftentimes, as things get super, 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 super busy, and you're in management, I'm in management, um, been in management, your admittance, you become more and more dependent on your administrative assistant or secretary. And there comes a certain point where you're, they do so much for you that sometimes they know more what's going on and how things have been than you do. <laughs> or at least anybody else in the industry, in the, in the business. And so this is my guess is, my guess is Bessie um, assumed control because she had more an intimate detail knowledge of what was going on. That's just a guess. But that, to me, that seems like a likely possibility. Um, and there's a lot of people who are in management that if it wasn't for their administrative assistant, uh, they'd be screwed. They'd be completely lost. They wouldn't be able to wipe their ass. Uh, and I've seen that. I've seen people weighing up in upper management that they're really freaking clueless. And the real brains behind what's going on uh, is the administrative assistant. Uh, but anyway, I could go on and on about that. But we'll move on to the next question. Um, did I get that one? Yeah, got that one. All right, next. In 2005, Lefroig was bought by Fortune Brands, which owned what? A, Akintoshan Distillery, B, Bowmore Distillery, C, Jim Beam Distillery, or D, Maker's Mark Distillery. So, Lafroig was bought by Fortune Brands, which owned what? Interesting note. Here's some, this is from uh, McKeever at 1984. Ian Hunter had a stroke while in America, or whilst, and she was the only person who could finish the negotiations over in, uh, in the States, she was a powerhouse and incredible. I, you know, I have absolutely no doubt about that whatsoever. Um, it, it just, and the reality is, okay, so, okay, so Duke says C, Dave says C, Belcher says C, uh, Jim Beams, uh, James says Mr. Beams, best invest, investment. And the answer is, Beam, Jim Beam Distillery. Um, I've seen this not only in businesses, but other otherwise. You know, it's a long time saying that behind every good man, great man is a, is a good woman or wife. Um, different people have different capabilities, different skills, different skill sets, and bring different attributes to a team. And I don't want to overgeneralize, but oftentimes a good wife or a good woman has certain capabilities that a man doesn't have. Uh, this is a generalization. That's sexist. You can't say there's no distinction between men and women. Screw you. There are differences between men and women more than just anatomy. I'm just saying. Um, and whether it's cultural or biological, psychological, you know, something you pick up from your parents. I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I, I'm not going to make that kind of argument, but I'm going to say, um, in my observation, in households, um, even if there's some sort of egalitarianism going on between a husband and wife, if it's a good marriage, oftentimes it's a wife who really knows what's going on is keeping things together and keeps things on track. I'm just saying. 
<laughs> that's been my observation. That's been my observation. Hmm. And I could see, having known people with very good wives, that that same skill set carried into the into the business, into the distillery, uh, would be just uh, as useful. I read Proverbs thirty. It talks about the attributes of a good wife, and one of them. I'm talking about the Bible, yes, is uh, her ability to run business. I'm just saying. All right. Uh, I'm not currently married, but if I met a woman like that, I'd consider it. Uh, all right, next. Oops, I already covered that one. All right, in 2014, Lafrog Distillery uh, ownership was bought out by, oh, the owner, so Jim Beam, was bought out by who's? Hold on. Have I screwed this up? Yes, Beam, Jim Beam. Say, so in 2014, the Laforg Distillery owner, we already settled that was Jim Beam, was bought out by who? Japanese group Suntory, B, Pernod Ricard, LVMH, or Diageo? So who bought out uh, Beam? Who bought out Beam? Uh, Dave C says C. I don't know if he's. I'm, when I'm reading the answers, it's hard to tell whether you're talking about the current question or previous one when I want to look at them. But anyway, so who bought out Beam? Who bought out Beam? If you're a bourbon fan, you already know this one. LVMH is Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy, or Moet Hennessy, Louis Vuitton. That Chris up says A. All righty. And the answer is... Japanese group Suntory. So Diageo owns Kalila and Lagavulin on Isla. LVMH owns Ardbeg on Isla. And I think this is the last question. Oh. Sorry. All right, here we go. I get these little tiny buttons I'm click clicking off the side. Sometimes it's hard to see which one I hit. All right. In 2008, Karchus Triple Wood was released. What does Karchus mean? A, from the C. By the way, some people pronounce this Cardias. It's pronounced Karchus. Kind of like car chase, like you're doing a car chase. But what does Karchus mean? A, from the C. B, very smoky. Or C, friendship. So the first Karchus came out in 2008, but what does Karchus mean? All three of these kind of make sense. Getting a lot of C's. Richard Agnew, McGeever, 1984, David Balcher, Duke McHale, everybody's saying friendship. And the answer is friendship. Ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -bum, ba -bum. All right. All right, so here's the notes for what I'm currently drinking. This is the Karchus Triple Wood Cast Strength. Karchus means friendship and Gaelic, and each year a limited edition bottling is crafted by distillery manager and fifth generation Isla native John Campbell. The Karchus Triple Wood Cast Strength Isla Single Malt Scotch Whiskey undergoes a triple maturation, first filled in ex bourbon, then in quarter cast, then finally European oak cast, which previously held Oloroso Sherry. It is then barrier filtered to so just get out the chunks, not show filtered, so you're not losing your oils, and bottled at cast strength to create a punchy dram with Lafroy's signature richness of flavor and smoky taste. Bottled at 59.9% alcohol by volume. Uh, retail, uh, well, I got the pound, 63.40. I don't remember how much I paid here in the United States. Um, but that's what it would cost in the UK. And I'm trying to remember why I didn't put the, UK, the, the US price in there. I didn't know, but I'm sure it's in my regular review. So Scott and Bart had reviewed this. They gave both gave it over 90 points or a Scott system. I mean, they really, really liked it. So uh, I had to get me a bottle. I had to get me a bottle of this. Hmm. So it's even this, even though it says Oloroso, when you take a bourbon cask 
And then maybe, you know, a second film, first of all, or even a second film, or also cask. You can kind of dial in the nature of the Oloroso. Typically, Oloroso is dried black fruits, fig, dates, raisins. I mentioned about the Lafroy 10 cherry cask, that the depthness, the darkness of the, of, of the sherry actually came across more as like a PX cask, but without the sweetness. If you dial in the um, Oloroso with, with, with a bourbon cast or you use a second film. The result is the Oloroso can come across actually a little bit more like a Fino cask. You get lighter caramels, get more maybe grilled apple, grilled pear, stone fruits. Um, there's a little bit of saltiness in there as well. And I was just thinking... Even though, so the Glen Goyne, I'm going to get this out. If you saw my review of the Glen Goyne cast strength, um, unchill filtered, in terms of the impact of the sherry cask, reminding me of a pheno cask, the, the sherry impact, forget the peat, bet, between the Lafroig triple wit and this is similar. Of course, one's painted, one's the other one's not. It's similar. And I only know that because I did that series on Sherry and Sherry Cashman's whiskeys, which I did. I don't know if I could find them here. I was I did the Tomatin, particularly the Tomatin Sherry Cast. Where did I put it? Oh, here we go. So I'm just gonna tell you. So this is the Tomat and Fino cask. If you can get one of these or the Manzanilla cask, I got one of those as well. Highly recommend it. Really, really nice whiskey. But when you scale back the intensity of an Oloroso cask with a bourbon cask, uh, Grumpy Old Fart says $100 in the United States. You know what? $100? Um, thanks, Grumpy Old Fart. $100, bucks, particularly in, in today's prices, Cast strength. Uh, if you can find one, I would grab it. I would. I would. I recommend grabbing the Lafroig, uh, uh, Cartridge Triple Wood. But if you can kind of calibrate your palate as to what a Fino or Manzanilla is like, uh, you can grab one of these. And these are really, really nice whiskeys. Highly recommend it. Highly recommend it. And of course, I did the to to Tobermory Fino Cask as well, so you can see there's some consistency between the different Fino Cask Fino Cask whiskeys. Fino Cask whiskeys. Uh, can be a little challenging to come by. Um, there is a, if you saw my video earlier this week, uh, there was a Karchis Fino cask. I don't recommend it. Um, for the class on Sherry and Sherry Cask Finish Whiskeys, um, I had bought some for the first time I taught the class, and the smoke and peat overwhelms the Fino cask. It, I don't think it's a great representative of a Fino cask. So even though I like Lafroig and I like Karches, it's an okay whiskey. But in terms of representative of Vino Cask, I, I don't recommend it. Um, so I, I, there are better Fino Cask representatives. Uh, the Glen Kinchy and some other ones are, are okay. Uh, but I, I like the, in terms of a non pita I like the uh, tomato ones. I like the tomato ones. Ninety nine here. Lower is one. Lower is one thirty nine. Holy cow! Ten is fifty four. I'd rather have this triple wood over the lower in a heartbeat. My first cartridge was the twenty twenty because my uh, first Isla was that year. Oh, cool! I heard it's fantastic. I I have the wine and port and the PX. The PX uh, Lafourg is very nice. I've not had a full bottle, but I was given a sample of it by uh, Dram Yankee, and it's that's really really nice. And he says he wasn't a big fan of the port cask. Port can sort of overwhelm a cask um, as PX can. My experience with port cask and, and, and what I like or not is hit and miss. I don't want a whiskey that it seems like somebody took a wine and just dumped it in there. Um, I, I like a much better integration 
between the wine cask uh, and uh, the whiskey and PX and both port can be sort of domineering to where it just, it, 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 if it's not done right, it can just seem like you just poured, you know, PX or port in, into a bottle. Uh, and sometimes distilleries do it on purpose. If they have a young whiskey and they're not in non a statement, um, say like some bourbons here in the United States, and they just want to sort of mask that and bring some extra sweet, sweetness and bring in some, you know, a, a bomb of fruit character to it and kind of do that. Um, if it keeps popping up, I'd move to Kilhoman cast uh, over Ardbeg, I think. Um, I'm not sure what you're referring to as uh, popping up, but if you're talking about prices and what's going on with the uh, committee releases, I probably, I would I would I would I totally agree with you. Particularly as Kilhoman uh, becomes much more and more and more of a mature distillery, uh, and they sort of dial in because they do some malting as well. Um, and dial those in and really come into their own. I mean, I already like Kilhoman, um, but yeah, I, I could see that. I really hope Dr. Bill Lumsden, uh, the guy knows his stuff, um, but this nonsense that's going on with the committee releases just has to come to an end. I will never, right now, I'm currently, I will never buy, I will never buy another one. Um, and, I, and I'll just stick to the, the car range, which I have, so unless the, the core ranges I have from Ardbeg sell out, uh, I mean, I, I empty the bottles, that means I'm not buying any more Ardbeg. Um, I'm also getting to where Young Pete is not my thing. I know Bart over at Scotch Test Dummies likes it. I'm not looking for peated whiskeys under 10 years old. Uh, I don't like that new makey. It's not, it doesn't offend me. It's just not my thing. Um, but there's some people that are so in love with just a big burst of, of, of smoke and peat. And so they'll drink that green new makey character whiskey and sort of ignore that because they're in favor of just a big blast of uh, peat smoke. And I'm just kind of not there. Um, I like more development, more evolution in the whiskey, which you're only going to get with age. You're only going to get that with age. I'm right now. I'm about down to here. Um, if I see another one, I will be grabbing another one of these. <sighs> oh, got a tasting with Dr. Bill next week. Had my embassy training with Ardbeg and raised the committee issues. I agree with you. Um, so you have a tasting with him next week. Had embassy training with Ardbeg and raised the committee issues. I agree with you. Interesting. So they're getting direct feedback on on issues related to the committee releases. Well, I hope they're taking notes and hope they're paying attention and hope it goes all the way to the top. Um, but the only thing with the, with, with the huge popularity of whiskeys and the blindness that can come with fandom... Um, I'm a little concerned that they'll only listen to the people or just pay attention to the dollars. I only listen to the people who, who are willing to applaud them. Anyway. Uh, I could take a good blast of every once in a while. I like the range. It's I like a blast of Pete and Smoke and all that, but I want more. I don't want like one chord song. You know, I don't want, I want, I want more complexity. Um, I like layers, you know, uh, Rush, a three member band, uh, fantastic band. They were very much a complex and multi-layered band. And yet they only had three members in the band. They could do more uh, with three members than what other bands would do with four or more. So the same thing can be done. It's, it, it's, uh, and they can be both powerful and also, I don't want to say delicate. They can go light. They could go um, delicate. They can have a lot of finesse in, the, in in their sound. I'm thinking of the song uh, "Lose It" 
on uh, the Signals album. I don't know. I'm getting off into music. Um, but then obviously, you know, the 2112 Overture, Passage to Bangkok, Tom Sawyer, much more of a, an early years Rush fan, you know, but the same thing goes for whiskeys. Um, <clears throat> I can like a big, powerful, peated whiskey, but I want more than that. I, I, I want layers of complexity to it. Um, I have a set path and goal and direction that I'm going with my channel. It's already laid out for the next two years as to what I'm doing. I'm really only going to be doing whiskeys that are part of that current study. I have a list of distilleries that I need to study. Um, you're going to see a lot more Scotch Malt Whiskey Society showing up on my channel. In fact, next week, I have a special bottling from Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. Uh, I already bought some other bottles. I am on uh, shopping for bottles of distilleries that are not otherwise available either here in the United States or they're not otherwise released to the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society because I want to cover every distillery. I'm hoping to get back to Scotland next year. I would like to visit some of those distilleries that you don't see bottlings here in the United States um, to get, get more behind the scenes familiarity with them. And maybe they don't get talked about so much. You know, everybody's talking about Springbank and now you can't get Springbank. Everybody talked about Aaron, you know, um, in the Oswa Awards, uh, which is going on right now uh, in terms of the, the voting and all that. And now you can't get them um, or they're very difficult to get. Uh, so the Oswa Awards, while bringing note to distilleries that are on your filtered natural color and so forth, and, and that's, and so maybe everybody else, you would hope they would take a clue and stop putting E150 and and chill filtering their whiskeys, you know, to get attention from the, from um, whiskey, true whiskey fans. Um, I doubt uh, the Oswas are going to have a serious impact in the industry as a whole. In the industry as a whole, but uh, I can hope that they will. Because as long as the money is being shelled out, it'll continue as is. Um, but anyway, so the, the challenge is in studying these other distilleries that don't otherwise bottle and getting them through the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, obviously to my viewers, if you're not a member of the, of the society, you can't get them. <coughs> Secondly, um, even if you're a member, that particular bottling will be gone because, you, you know, it's only like one barrel or whatever for that particular bottling um, or maybe two, however they do it. They're limited releases, but also... You know, there are distilleries who make whiskeys that are designed to go into a blend. They're not designed to be standalone whiskeys. So while it may be academically and interesting to taste them on their own, I'm sure it's very, very, very good. What I'm sort of expecting is <clears throat> they're going to not be as complex as I'm going to want them to be because they're not designed to stand on their own. They're designed to be going in and be blended with other distilleries because they're typically going into blends, which is why you don't see them bottled on their own. But that's okay in terms of the, from a study aspect. Um, I could even, of course, at home get into your own doing your own blending. In fact, I did that when I did I did that uh, live stream with Scott from Scotch Testimonies came on, and I shared I had six bottles that I had bought, <clears throat> and I poured you know like this much of each. But during the live stream, I only drink about half of them and then cover them up. The next day, off camera, I was blending those whiskeys uh, that what was left in the glasses. I blended three and three to make you know, one dram and a second dram. And they were absolutely fantastic. They're absolutely fantastic. So for those bottles that you get from a distillery that typically the spirit isn't bottled, typically it's going into a blend is buy those bottles, taste it, enjoy it as it is, but then realize, hey, I'm going to become my own master blender with non-show filtered natural color whiskeys and, and start blending these um, to make my own spirits, to make my own whiskeys. Because off camera, uh, there were the three together and three together, they were so much better, so much better than how I then when I tasted when I was live during the live stream. So 
I will probably not only just to, to enjoy the whiskeys, but to sort of play around with the whiskeys uh, off camera and and practice blending, home blending. Um, start doing that. Uh, last was it last Saturday? Yeah, last Saturday, uh, the tribe video. Um, they did a video in which Daniel was walking them through. What if you have a whiskey that isn't quite what you want it to be and doing home blending to sort of fix a whiskey? So Daniel walked Rex and Brianna through that. If you haven't seen that video, highly recommend it. Check it out. That's my kind of uh, um, whiskey uh, tribe video. Uh, yeah, I like the more geeky side. And Daniel said, yeah, that's more of his kind of a thing as well. The White Claw crap. Yeah, I'm not into that. And the go and the overly goofiness. Yeah, I'm not into that. A little humor is, is fine. But let's do a service to the to the to the consumer, um, rather than try to convince people not to drink white claw crap. But that's something I would like to uh, do more and more of. And I know there are other whiskey tubers who do home blending and have more experience and more practice with that. But I hope to get into that uh, as well. Uh, yeah, YYZ. I mean, it's a completely instrumental song by Rush. Um, I mean, I, I've been listening to that album. You know, um, since it first came out, you know, 30 plus years ago. Um, and it's an amazing, amazing song, the complexity of it. Um, all right. I'm just reading here in the comments. Uh, will you be getting the newer Compass Box Flaming Heart? Um, no, because I mean, I could buy one, but it would sit on my shelf forever because as I mentioned before, so I already have for the next year and a half to two years, I've got every video already planned out because I'm studying distilleries. I'm going to study this distillery, then this one, then this one, then this one. And compass box is not on that itinerary. I have an itinerary for what I'm studying and covering for the next two years. And because you know, I'm sure it's a very nice whiskey, but because it's not on the itinerary and I have limited shelf space, I will not be buying I'll not be buying it. So anyway. Alrighty. So we're getting close to an hour. Um, and getting kind of hungry. Time for uh, dinner time. Um if you have any comments, if you have any questions uh after end of this live stream, leave them down below. Um, I want to thank everyone for uh, tuning in. Hope everyone has a great weekend. So we, we're currently going through Isla as part of this study in which I um, have the history, uh, that provide the history, go much more in depth than what the textbook does for, for this current study. Uh, this next week, we'll be looking at Bowmore. I got two bottles from Bowmore. One is the Aston Martin, 20, 21-year-old like Aston Martin. Another one is a Bowmore uh, special rare cask from Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. I'll be doing separate videos on both of these. And then next week during the live stream, I'll sort of do a comparison between the two. However, one is a share cask, the other one is a bourbon cask or hogshead, but bourbon cask. Uh, so there's a different profile there, but I'm going to do a comparison uh, between, um, actually, actually, I have a Bowmore 20 year old bourbon cask from Hunter Lang as well. Where is it? Where did I put it? Actually, that's what I'm going to do. That's fine. I just changed my mind. Where did I? Sorry. I'm looking for it. Da -da -ba -da -ba it's here somewhere. Oh, I know. Here it is. All right. So next Saturday, I'm going to go head to head. This is a Bowmore 20 year old from uh, Hunter Lang. Old particular. Where did I put it? This is a 17-year-old Bowmore from the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. I'll be reviewing, I've already reviewed this one. I'll be reviewing this one this next this next week. But next week, next Saturday, I will go when I go live, I'll go head to head between these two. Both of them basically bourbon cast. One's a 17-year-old, the other one's a 20-year-old. This one's at uh, 57%. This is at small print 52 so one's got a little bit more age 
Then it's got a little more higher, slightly higher ABV, but two really, really nice bourbon casks. All righty. Hope everyone has a great weekend, and we'll see you all next week. And let's go out with a little bit of rock and roll. <laughs>